Hi, everybody. I wanted to take some time today to talk about one of my absolute favorite things in The Great Gatsby, Nick and Carraway as an unreliable narrator, or as some people might call him, a liar. So at the very beginning of the novel, we learned several things about our narrator. Mostly, we learned that he comes from a wealthy family. His grandfather's brother was kind of the founder of the family. He came to the United States in 51, and he soon got enough money that he was able to send a substitute to the Civil War to fight for him. This is something that only wealthy and white people were able to do. So Nick comes from a wealthy family, and they've been wealthy for three generations. Okay. The other prominent thing about Nick is he's a World War I veteran. He tells us that he liked the war so much that he came back restless. This I take to be an interpretation of him having shell shock, or as we call it today, PTSD. And because of this, he ends up going to New York City. He can no longer kind of hang out in the Middle West. It feels weird to him. So he heads out to New York City, where he decides he will work in the bond business. Remember, the novel takes place in the 1920s when the stock market was just going up, up, and up. So he, as Nick says, can probably expect the bond business to support one more single man. The other thing to note is that his dad financially supports him during this time, right? So even though Nick lives in this dingy little house and he's working at the bond business, his dad is still paying all of his bills. So even if Nick may not have come to money independently, he comes from a family of wealth. So keep that in mind. The other thing you got to recognize is Nick is a snob. Yep, he's a big snob. But don't take my word for it. Take Scott Donaldson's word for it. In his essay talking about Nick Carraway in the collection Fitzgerald and Hemingway, he opens his essay on Nick saying, Nick is a snob. He dislikes people in general and denigrates them in particular. He dodges emotional commitments, neither his ethical code nor his behavior is exemplary. Basically, what he's talking about here is these things boil down to Nick is a judgy McJudgerson who becomes an unreliable narrator at times because of this. But in spite of or maybe because of Nick's unreliability, he's a great narrator for Gatsby. So right at the beginning of our novel, diving in in chapter one, we have the novel open with this famous phrase where Nick talks about how his dad told him in his younger and more vulnerable years that, you know what, whenever you feel like criticizing people, just remember they haven't had all those advantages you've had. And Nick thinks about it. And literally in that same exact sentence, he starts judging people. He talks about how he has had to deal with veteran bores and curious natures. He literally can't make it three sentences into the novel without judging someone. And as Donaldson points out, Nick is really misinterpreting his dad's advice. He almost reads it as Nick's dad realizes he's a snob who judges people and tries to tell him, uh, maybe pump the brakes there. Nick instead interprets this to say like, you're right, I can still judge and criticize these people, but I have to realize it's because they weren't taught manners. So Nick inter misinterprets this advice and we see from literally the first page of the novel that Nick is a snob and he judges and he condemns pretty much everybody he sees in the novel. While he ends up being okay with Gatsby in the end, he still has a lot of things to judge Gatsby for. Okay. The other thing too is Nick then uses the same phrase snobbish on the second page of the novel when he talks about how his dad snobbishly suggested and he snobbishly repeats that there's a sense of fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. So Nick almost reads this as you just have the luck of the lottery of birth with whether you're going to be born a classy person or an unclassy person, right? He literally can't help but judge people. So keep this in mind. Um, but his judgment isn't just straightforward. He's also pretty sarcastic, right? So think about those elements of irony. When Daisy asks, do they miss me in Chicago? Nick says, the whole town's desolate. The cars have the left rear wheel painted black as a mourning wreath, and there's a persistent wail all along the North Shore. He's so sarcastic. People aren't this upset about Daisy, but he has to say it this way too. Right? Daisy later asks him, do you want to hear about the butler's nose? And he says, oh, that's why I came over. Right, So Nick is pretty sassy. So keep these in mind. Okay, And as you start reading this novel, focusing on all the ways Nick's, Nick is judging people, you can probably find a judgment in every single paragraph. Seriously, he spends the whole novel doing this. Try it out. Moving on, though, we get chapter two where Nick gets to meet Myrtle and he's like, thanks, I kind of hate everyone in this chapter. 
So he meets Myrtle the mistress, and while he's interested in hearing about her and seeing her, because remember, this is hot gossip, Nick doesn't actually want to talk to her, because remember, he's a snob. And then when he goes to the apartment party, he talks about how he's only been drunk twice in his life, but uh, just so happens that everything happens to have this dim, hazy cast over it. So it's kind of useful for our unreliable narrator to say, oh, it's a shame I don't remember things more clearly. This happened to be one of the only two times that I was drunk. Keep that in mind. I will also revisit it in a few minutes. The other thing that people like to notice when they talk about Nick being an unreliable narrator, and also my friends who do queer theory, is his interaction with Mr. McKee. So this here, these are not my ellipses. These are Fitzgerald's ellipses. He's talking with Mr. McKee. They're leaving Myrtle's apartment. They're going down in the elevator. And there's this weird little pun that's delightful. Keep your hands off the lever. I beg your pardon. I didn't know I was touching it. And right after Mr. McKee says he didn't know he was touching it, Nick says, all right, I'd be glad to. Whether he's glad to touch his lever or not, we don't know because Fitzgerald gives us three, uh, three little dots, otherwise known as an ellipses. He completely skips over, and the next thing he knows, he's standing beside Mr. McKee's bed, who was in his underwear in his bed. We don't know what happened, but here's another element of Nick being an unreliable narrator. If he's done something he's maybe not proud of or he doesn't want to share, he will avoid telling us about that. Okay, and then finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about for today is Gatsby's giant party. Now, remember, our boy Nick is a snob, so he keeps pointing out that he had actually been invited. And because he's a snob, he feels like he has to hold to these social conventions. And at a formal party, you say thank you to your host. So he spends so much of his time at the party looking for Gatsby. And remember how I said I was going to come back to that whole part about him being drunk? Totally lied about being drunk only twice in his life. If Nick tells us in chapter two that he's only been drunk twice in his life, and that was the second time at the apartment party, but then he also tells us that he was on his way to getting roaring drunk at Gatsby's party, which happens after, take it for yourself, my exhibit A, Nick is a liar, okay? The other thing in chapter three that I always like to point out is Nick is also a cheater. In chapter one, right as he's leaving Daisy and Tom's house, they come outside and they basically say, we heard that you were engaged and we heard it from multiple people, so it must be true. And Nick says, nope, that is a libel, I'm too poor. Remember, he's not poor, okay? Um, but if you aren't familiar with this phrase where they talk about how they published the bands, Back in the day, in order to get married, you had to publish your wedding bands in the newspaper for three weeks, letting people know that you were planning on getting married. So Nick is talking about how he's complained that the gossip papers basically announced this engagement, and Nick doesn't want to just stop seeing this girl because everybody expects them to get married, but he also didn't want to be pressured into marriage, so that's part of the reason why he went out west. Now, fast forwarding to chapter three, and he has Jordan in his sights. He looks at Jordan at the end of the party and he thinks he might love her, but oof, he had to get himself out of this tangle back home because he's still writing love letters to this not fiance fiance and he's signing them, love Nick. Those letters aren't for Jordan. They're for this nameless girl back home. But what he says is, and I'll move my picture here. He says there was this vague understanding. So basically he was kind of engaged and didn't want to be. And then he decided he needed to break up with Jordan because, or he needed to break up with this girl so he could be with Jordan. Nick's a classy guy. So as you continue reading The Great Gatsby, seriously, try reading this book and thinking the whole time that Nick is just judging everybody. You can find so many examples of it and it becomes pretty delightful, okay? Um, and these can be subtle things or they can be rather explicit. One of my favorites in chapter four is how he judges Meyer Wolfsheim, especially his uh, molar cufflinks, and also how he judges Gatsby for just being so extra and adamant about his past history, which Nick thinks this definitely sounds fake. Um, he's also very entranced by Gatsby, so keep in mind that his infatuation with Gatsby, remember, shout out to my queer theory friends, um, think in my, keep in mind that being enraptured by somebody could be a thing that causes you to then potentially become unreliable when it comes to them. Okay. So keep this in mind. I hope you enjoy reading The Great Gatsby and special thanks to Donaldson and his great essay on Nick. All right.